Well, good afternoon, students, members of the faculty and staff, and visitors to our campus. Uh, my name is Michael Trick, and I'm the dean here at Carnegie Mellon University in Qatar. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all to today's dean's lecture series. Uh, before I introduce our speaker today, um, I want to reminisce a little bit. Uh, I took this job five days after the start of the blockade. And I will say I was a little uncertain what I was going to face when I arrived in Qatar and the face uh, uh, of the blockade. And I was then heartened by a particular scene, the scene of dairy cows filing off of a Qatar Airways flight onto the tarmac of Hamad International Airport. I knew then here was a country that was going to survive and thrive in the face of the illegal blockade. Um, it was a news story that caught the attention of the world. Um, if people know anything about Qatar now, it is the World Cup's coming here and you have cows in an air-conditioned barn in the middle of the desert. This tiny country with few natural food resources has found a solution in the face of adversity. In the two years since the blockade, uh, Baladna Food Industries has built up Qatar's dairy industry, so now Qatar is now self-sufficient in milk production and in fact even an exporter of milk and they continue to expand into new products. Our speaker today is Dr. Kamal Abdallah, the CEO of Baladna Food Industries. Dr. Abdallah has worked in the food industry throughout the region. He was CEO of Ocean Industries, which is now Ocean Coca-Cola, CEO, CEO of Exceed Industries, and the managing director of Atco Food Industries in Oman. Dr. Abdullah holds a PhD in strategic management from, from the Ohio State University. Um, and has served as Assistant Vice President and Professor of Strategy and Finance at the American University of Beirut. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kamal Abdullah to the Dean's Lecture Series. It's a pleasure uh, to be here. Uh, whenever you come to university, you see the future, but you see the future today. So uh, thank you for inviting me to come to this uh, campus. It's my first time here. Uh, I'm going to speak briefly uh, about uh, what we have done over the last two years, but I'll be talking from the perspective of uh, national uh, food security and what the private sector can do and is doing to make that a reality here for us in, in Doha. Uh, national food security these days is a, is a buzzword. You hear it uh, every day, uh, even at dinner. Now children ask you about food security. And this is very different from the old days when uh, people didn't know what that meant. Now that's good and it's equally bad because national food security means different things to different people. And today I hope I'll give you at least a sense of where the private sector is and where Baladna fits in and how Baladna has served as a successful model for Doha, for Qatar in ensuring self-sufficiency in a record time in the region. So I have to start with disclaimers. We are going for an IPO, as some of you know. And I have to start with the usual uh, disclaimers that the views here represent my views and not necessarily Baladna. And in the unlikely event that we have the press corps here, uh, consider these comments as off-the-record comments unless uh, uh, we talk afterwards and I confirm especially uh, the facts. Uh, so we'll talk about several points. The first one is uh, food security has gone mainstream and is becoming now central to any economic uh, program for the governments. Second point is uh, why is food security in the GCC different than food security programs, uh, at least in other parts of the world? We'll be talking about the public-private partnership and how, for us, in Qatar, we really need to go beyond public-private partnership and include universities, including the university here, as an integral part of what we are doing to achieve at, uh, our food security objectives. And uh, finally, we will highlight the challenges that we will face. Uh, food security now is supported, and everybody is supporting us. 
and we have, uh, in a way, Rubba uh, Darra Nafia, the blockade, helping us. But one day, uh, the blockade will be, will be lifted, and there will be other priorities. So for us, it's very important to ensure sustainability, what will happen uh, after two, three years. And we'll talk about the challenges that companies are facing or would face, and highlight Baladna as a case in point. So, uh, Baladna. Uh, I've been in the region for about two years, and I have to say that even though we spent several billion, of, sorry, of these uh, 18 years I've been in the region, I've never seen anything done in two years that we have done, that was done in Baladna. We went from zero cows on June 5, 2017, to now having around 20,000 cows in about two years plus. Today at Baladna, every day we have 40 newborn. We have uh, one of the best uh, Tawlid departments in which every day we are having 40 newborn Qatari cows. Uh, we went from being a small farm, goat and sheep, 400,000 uh, square meters to now being over 2.7 million square meters. We went from zero barns to now having around 40 barns that are state of the art, as well as 20 barns for the young stock. And these are state of the art, the ones that probably you would see in a James Bond movie, if you, if you are talking about the future. We went from zero parlors to, to six uh, parlors, including a hospital parlor, from one factory to three factories, and so on. Uh, I can go on and on on the number of first. I have to say, one of the things we are very proud of is that over the last one year, we have introduced over 100 new products in the market. And the reception from people it has been very positive because the quality is good, the product is consistent, and the products add value to people. When I did my PhD in the 80s, very few people used the word uh, strategy. Nowadays, uh, when you take a taxi, he will, he will tell you, the driver, that he has a strategy to get you to your, to your appointment on time by bypassing the roundabout. So strategy has become such a buzzword that I'm concerned to use it. And I'll have to add uh, the word disruptive technologies is becoming another buzzword uh, lately. Uh, artificial intelligence is the third one. I had to remove uh, on my email uh, this phrase that said, sent by your smartphone. Uh, even our phones are claiming to be smart these days. Uh, and lastly, the word sustainability. So if you take these words and add them in any way you want, you'll end up with a very intelligent uh, presentation and speech. Um, so I, I'm mindful that my presentation includes these words, the use of disruptive technologies to achieve sustainable uh, national food security strategies. But in reality, beyond the buzzwords, it is actually happening uh, for us. Now, why is uh, food security important? We know the obvious. Uh, if you look at population in the region, we are doubling. Number of people under the age of 21 represent around 50% of the population and continuing to grow. If we look at our land, if we look at our land, almost 90% of it is historically not used and cannot be used historically for agriculture. If you look at food consumption, 90%, up to 90% of food is imported or has been imported. If you look at the food basket, you find out that it's highly dependent on government support to make sure the prices remain low so that people can afford it historically. And frankly, those were the good days. Oil was selling at $100, $120. Governments were running surpluses and governments could afford to spend on subsidizing food. But these days are changing. The other thing that's very important to, to highlight to you is the issue of health. Uh, diabetes in the region is among the highest uh, in the world. The problem, for example, with diabetes is that in the rest of the world, it starts at around type two, around age 43, 44. In our region, it's going down to the ages of the 30s. Add to it the issue of obesity. We're having a serious obesity issue with young uh, children, especially the teenage uh, children. So 
What does that mean in simpler terms? Simpler terms, it means I have now people getting sick and they are li living longer and longer till the age of 80, which means somebody has to take care of them and pay for their medications, which means the government's budget on health is going, health cost will going to increase. And that's another unsustainable situation. So these two things are happening uh, at the same time when we are talking about food and food costs and about government subsidies. What we are saying, government historic programs had to change. And national food security nowadays, with its emphasis on homegrown food, is the way to, is the way to go. So food security typically used to be the triple A's, you know, availability, affordability, awareness. It didn't matter where we buy the food. It didn't matter what the government subsidized it on. It mattered that it's available and affordable. As long as you can keep people happy, there are no issues. Alhamdulillah, Baladna has achieved those triple A's. In terms of availability, we're available everywhere. In terms of affordability, we'd like to think we are affordable. And uh, in terms of awareness, people are aware of our brand. But food security is much more nowadays than, than triple A. Government subsidies cannot continue to support imported food. With the blockade we've seen in Ramadan, that blockade was used as a political imperative to stop uh, the milk and other food coming into the country. We said the health concerns pose a major risk. And then nowadays, uh, food security is about homegrown. So this is the new definition of, home, uh, of national food security. In a way, food is now medicine. Food is being proactive. Food is ensuring that we have long lives. And to have food on the table, you need local players producing locally in a sustainable way to ensure success of these programs. So we have a lot of competition in the region. Not only uh, Qatar is trying to have its own national food security program, but so is every country in, in the region. Uh, our market size is very small. We are 2.5 million people. It's not as easy when you have 2.5 million people as compared to a country with 20 million or 30 million people to have a sustainable business model with such a small market. Our Qatari customers are frankly one of the most developed, advanced in the region. They demand, they have high expectations, they demand good food, uh, they are very active on social media. And believe you me, anytime we have a single product that's giving us problems, we hear about it from so many people. You have now uh, young teenagers talking to us about words that historically we didn't know. I don't know the campus food here. I remember at, at least at AUB, at, uh, at AU, and at Ohio State, we had one cafeteria that had all the food in it. And what mattered to us was that it was cheap food. When I visited uh, my daughter's uh, university's cafeteria, she goes to Brown in the US, they had a section for vegan food, they had a section for veggie, vegetarian food, and I can't even remember the other terms they had on the, on the different food sides. So when it comes to our customers, especially their own customers, they will no longer accept client any kind of food. Lastly, we are spending a lot of money on high tech equipment, but our employees, the skill set of our employees, especially when you're talking about the farms, about the factories, is not what you consider at the, at the high tech level. We are using unskilled labor to manage very high tech manufacturing which is also a challenge. And let's not forget the pressures coming from everybody, whether the macroeconomic or the legislative side, on continuous regulations in the food business. So we have to manage all of those. And the way to manage them, frankly, and to be successful, is to have a public-private partnership whereby the government gives us the direction, the overall direction and objectives, and the private sector actually deliver but you need cooperation between the two. That's the optimal model. We all know that the government, when they execute, instead of the private sector, generally it doesn't work. And we know the private sector working on its own uh, doesn't work. Let me give you here a quick example from our experience at Baladna. We are now having 100% self-sufficiency in milk, fresh milk production. Now, as you know, we are now trying to follow and following the European rules on milk. Now, before that, 
you could have powdered milk in the country. And as a matter of fact, most of the competitors would write fresh on it, but it was made from powder. Now, in Europe, you are not allowed to do that. Thank God the government here was proactive and saying no more using the word fresh milk from powder, and actually you cannot even use powder to have milk. Okay. Without that, we would not have been able to sell our product at the price that we are charging. So that would be an example of a public-private partnership in ensuring that the country can achieve its, private, uh, its food security objectives and the company can be sustainable. I would ask prior to, to uh, a few minutes ago, you know, uh, Baladna is everywhere. Is it because you are, uh, you know, protected where nobody else can be there? No, we are everywhere because we are following the new rules. And any company that would follow the new rules, okay, will have the same advantages that, uh, that we have. But the stretch targets in Qatar are very ambitious. Uh, we were talking about Qatar 2030. Now we are talking about self-sustainability in food in less than that time. We achieved it within two years in dairy. Now the government is targeting vegetables in another two years. And in the future, near future, they will be talking about uh, meat self-sufficiency as well. So these are very heavy stretch targets. When you say two years to go from 100% importing milk to 100% having milk, Believe you me, this doesn't happen uh, over time. It doesn't happen easy. The other thing is to keep in mind that when we are talking about food farms, we are talking about livestock. Livestock gets sick. Livestock doesn't take off on the weekend. Our cows milk seven days a week, 24-7. And any one disease, God forbid, will affect us. So the risk for us is very high. The second thing is there are attractive returns, and I have to say that because we're going for the IPO, but it's true. But equally, our medium term horizon is what defines our vision, not our short term. I mean, if you were a trader, you would quickly uh, buy something low, sell it high, make some money, and call it a day. When you are in agriculture, you are looking for the seasons, you are looking for livestock, you are looking for a, a production of crop, it's not a trader's mentality. It's a much more longer term uh, horizon, medium term horizon. And people need to understand that as they're working with you, with you on it. So food security really is a different mindset when it comes to financial returns. Not in terms of the indicators, the return on investment, but in terms of the timelines and what have you. So us as a private sector, ultimately we need confidence building investments that make sense. You cannot go to the private sector and say, put all your money in, in, in one basket. Also, we need the infrastructure. Every project we are doing at Baladna requires water. Every project we are doing at Baladna requires electricity. And without power generation, and without the infrastructure, we will not be successful. But we cannot do those on our own. We need the government to do them. And our expectation is from the, as a private sector is that the government has to step in. The third is the legislation. We want, as we said, the supportive legislation, and then we want a one-stop shop uh, for the legislations. We were talking that uh, one of the things for you who've been to Baladna is the restaurants at the educational park uh, that we have at Baladna. Uh, let me just have, by a show of hands, let me get a feel. How many of you have been to Baladna, actually? So that, uh, okay. For those of you who are still with me, at least, uh, following the course. OK. We have a good group here. OK. So you know we have a restaurant there. Now, you know that per the legislation, actually, technically, you cannot have a restaurant next to a farm. OK. So it has been a challenge. Is Baladna only a farm? No, we have a factory. We have a community. And Baladna is a destination. We have 2,000 people visiting us. And we need them to visit us for many reasons. So when we're talking about the one-stop shop, we are working with the different government agencies to ensure that what one approved works well with the other, because this is a new area where the legislation and the procedures has not caught up with this. As a matter of fact, I have meetings only next week to particularly address the issue of should we close the restaurants as some of them want us to do, or keep it open as other agencies say we should. And finally, as we said, as a private sector, we look at the, at the payback. At the end of the day, I know this is a business school. And the only thing that's sustainable is if it's profitable. 
for all stakeholders, including the shareholders. And without that criteria, food security will not be, will not be sustainable. The public sector, on the other hand, they like big uh, projects. They talk immediately about 100% maybe self-sufficiency, when we know that has to be gradual. Their emphasis correctly is satisfying the local market, and that's very important for them, while for us as a private company, we might be interested equally in exports. They talk about putting the infrastructure, and then the question is the cost, and are they oversizing it or undersizing it? And both are problems. You oversize infrastructure, it becomes very costly for us. And you undersize it, it limits our growth. And they are talking about ensuring long-term horizons, while for us in the private sector are much more. So what are the success factors for us? Uh, frankly, like innovation, public-private partnership generally do not necessarily succeed. Very few do. And if you take about public-private partnership and food security, we are missing the U. Without the U, we cannot succeed. And interestingly enough, the U here is universities as well as U as a, as a university. Qatar can only be competitive, not if Baladna and the private sector is competitive only, not if the government is competitive and active, not if the universities are com competitive and active, but only if the three parties to competitiveness connect. The strength of Qatar will depend on the linkages between the universities and the private sector and the government sector. Without these linkages, we will not succeed, especially in, in, in food security. Now, more to the point, when we are looking about agriculture, we have to understand that this region was nat naturally made for agriculture. So you really need disruptive technologies. Animal comfort is very important. Animal comfort in, in that the cows have to experience a minimum level or a maximum level of temperature. But the temperature in Qatar is very high. So only by using technologies that would allow us to have the speed of wind in a barn at 19 miles an hour can we achieve that. And that's not what you see typically in a farm in Europe or in a farm in the US where the cows just graze outside without any special cooling. And this applies to every level. Now, for us, as a local company, we don't have budgets on R&D. That's a challenge for us. Our competitors globally, they all have big budgets on R&D. Now, you have budgets on R&D, so it goes back to the linkages. If we connect you with us, and we focus on relevant research that makes sense to us and to you, then we will be successful. Alhamdulillah, Qatar Foundation has been ahead of most research uh, granting institutions in the region and the world. For this year, they declared that national food security will be at the center of the research grants they are awarding. Already, I'm proud to say Baladna is a co-investigator co with about 12 research grants submitted by Qatar Foundation universities, including uh, Cornell, which is misspelled here, uh, Tamuk, Texas A&M, uh, as well as Qatar University in GRD. Inshallah, as the dean and I were talking, we'll have uh, Carnegie Mellon join us uh, on these things. A quick word about food security. You know, food security is really a complicated uh, environment. Uh, it starts with water, then you have to go and look at everywhere from backward integration of farming, of the animal feed. Right now we are importing all our animal feed. We have to maintain six months of animal feed stock. Then you are going to look at the processing as well, the farms with the livestock, the cattle feed, the poultry feed, the horse feed, and the camel feed milling, the flour mills. Then you need to look at the livestock farms, the dairy herd, and then organic milk. I'm asked about organic milk more than anything else, and we are working on getting organic milk to Qatar within the next uh, six to nine months, inshallah, as well as the other farms. Finally, they're processing the milk and the yogurt, uh, as well as others, and then the selling of the product. So this is the whole framework of food security. And food security is not only about the food, it's about the packaging. We have packaging in terms of plastic cans, and then the question becomes, what kind of packaging do you want? As you know, plastics nowadays is no longer popular, and people are moving to, uh, to other forms than plastics. So this is, in very brief, and I know I can spend a lecture on this, this is the National Food Security Framework. And 
within that, in Qatar, we have to worry about the following questions. One, water. Water will be more expensive, not already more expensive than oil. Underground water is already being challenged and food and agriculture require a lot of water. So we need the right water technologies to sustain us. Second thing is nutrition. We really need not only changes in government regulation on what is healthy, but we needed changes in people's behaviors of what is, what to, how to eat healthy. In the old days, it was about calories. Nowadays, we know you can have a lot of calories, but you can get very bad food. In the old days, when I was young, I used to argue with my parents about my allowance, and it was very easy as an index. My allowance was the equivalent of a, the price of a Pepsi plus chocolate. That was my equivalent uh, daily allowance. Imagine every kid eating Pepsi and chocolate, which I did for many years. These, both of them are very bad. One is full of sugar, and the other one is not even uh, dark chocolate. It's, it's very lousy. So we need this nutrition and wellness changes uh, in, the, in the country, especially if we want people to live longer as a healthy older people, versus dependent on the government to keep on giving them the, the, the diabetic medicine and the heart pressure medicine uh, and the blood pressure medicine and the heart rate. The third point is cold chain. We are in a very hot weather. Without cold chain, we cannot succeed, which is proper cold chain. If our delivery driver opens the door 10 times during the day for 30 seconds, whatever inside the truck goes bad as milk. So you have to open the door of this truck, and you need the sensors to immediately close it while he or she are doing the delivery. And finally, and this is an area that depends on you and us as a community, is food waste. You cannot have food security without addressing the issue of food waste. Up to 40% of the food produced is thrown away as unfinished on people's place. And we don't have the recycling now systems whereby you can take that food and reprocess it, either as animal feed or as something else. Unless we address this issue of food waste and food consumption, we will not have a sustainable food security program. All of these are serious issues that require, again, not the private sector, but the public, the private sector, and the universities, both in their role as educators and in their role as researchers in their role to address it together. Now, case of Baladna, and I know people wanted to talk about uh, Baladna, and maybe that's one of the reasons I'm, I am uh, asked to speak here. Uh, Mr. Flying Cow, my, wi my wife, gives me a hard time. Uh, she says, you've gone from being in a, in a bar to being in a barn. And I say, yeah, that's, uh, that's the case. Not that I was ever in a, in a barn. But Qatar before blockade was dominated by non-Qatari players. Nowadays, alhamdulillah, local Qatari players are dominant. In the case of Baladna, we, pr we showed that one local player could produce self-sufficiency. Qatar before the blockade was a traditional market with limited innovations where essentially you dump products in the country. Whatever is cheap in one country or wasn't used, you bring it here, you sell it. Now we moved with a country with a lot of innovations in products. Baladna already has lactose-free, only among so many innovations that we are doing as we proceed. We had slow execution uh, of uh, announced plans in Qatar before the blockade. Alhamdulillah, Rabbi Darra Nafia, the blockade became a call to action. It said to everybody, the old days are gone, you have to work and you have to work very fast. And in Baladna, we were able to put Again, 100% self-sufficiency, producing 100 million liters of milk from zero in less than two years with a team of 1,000 people from over 100 countries with equipments being run, commissioned at the same time that you're milking the cow, at the same time you're doing the sales. So now, as we say, it, it's the fast that beats the slow. And in Qatar, we're doing that, alhamdulillah, successfully. And finally, the linkages to the national economic components were not there. Now we have them done, as we mentioned. All of this, again, was done in, in, in two years. I always like to compare Qatar and the story of Baladna to the stories of David and, and Goliath. Not from the religious angle, not at all, but from Qatar being, if, and people who, who are familiar with the story know that David, who was shorter, faster, slimmer, but he used the new technology used a different technology as going after Galaya, the big giant. Qatar has done that in the region. We are surrounded by big countries, you know, Iran, Saudi, Turkey, Egypt. We are small. We are like Canada to the U.S. Okay. If we are going to fight these countries, 
and fight is not in the military way. If we are going to compete with these countries, Qatar has been successful and will have to play by new rules. It will have to invent its own rules. That's the only way we are like David. That's the way we've done it in Baladna, by putting disruptive technologies and new technologies, proper execution, animal health, animal comfort. And we've been able, alhamdulillah, following the vision of His Highness and his full support to us, to execute getting this 100% sufficiency. This will have to apply on the other parts of food security. We have to continue being the Davids against the Goliaths that are, that are around us. No presentation uh, to a college campus uh, has to, uh, happens without uh, pictures. Just a couple things to remind people of what makes us uh, strong. This was our journey. In very brief, the blockade happened in June 5, 2017. In July 7, 2017, the cows came in. So in less than one month, we picked them, we did genetics testing on them, we did vaccinations, and we flew them in in less than one month by plane. By July 11, that's one month and almost four days, we were milking. Qatar was milking cows in less than 40 days from the day of the blockade was announced. And remember, nobody gave us heads up about the blockade. Even the cows were surprised by the welcoming they get when they landed here. Uh, you have to remember for our cows, they came in July, and they came at the time from Holland and Germany. Okay, they, were, they came to a hot weather, and they were surprised by the welcome attention that, uh, that they get. We have nice videos to share about how people reacted to the cows coming in. Okay, it showed how responsive, how proactive can we be when we all work together. Generally, to bring cows in or any kind of livestock, you have a lot of bureaucratic hurdles you have to go through, from quarantines to ensuring uh, protocols on vaccinations to ensuring a lot of these. His Highness gave the instructions and the Council of Ministers to speed up those. And without that, we wouldn't have been able to succeed. Our cows, I have to say, are, besides being the only cows that have flown, and yes, we are the country of the flying cows, they are the most spoiled cows that you'd find around the world. They are very comfortable. We have the best practices adapted. Our cows are monitored 24-7. We have more data for people who like data mining uh, to look at than probably anybody in the, in the country and in the region. There's a collar on every cow. It tells us when the cow is chewing because we know if it slows its chewing, that means it's probably going to produce less milk and might be getting sick. We know its temperatures and we know when it's getting ready uh, at least to accept a pregnancy uh, IVF treatment. We have a 20% pregnancy uh, rate at Baladna. As I said, we have 40 new cows every, every day. Uh, many of you have already seen this if you've been to our, uh, to our uh, farm. Our cows know how to stand in line on their own, in and out, better than probably many, many kids at movie theaters around here waiting in line. And because of that, we have one of the highest yield. Our yield per cow per day is 31 liters today. It used to be about 16 liters. We are visited today by a Malaysian delegation who since 1980 in Malaysia have been trying to achieve self-sufficiency in milk since 1980. Since 1980 till now, they still have only 10% self-sufficiency in milk production in Malaysia. And now we are working together where Qatar is the model for Malaysia on how to achieve reasonable self-sufficiency uh, quickly. And one of the ways is to increase, of course, the milk per cow per day. This is farm two that was built in under one year. We have two separate farms, and that's for biosecurity reasons. This is uh, the green stuff that you see is the storage. We have six months feed stock. You cannot have food security and milk and not have the feed. The next challenge for us is to now farm our own feed here using the new technologies on, uh, on having farming for alpha alpha in the country. Uh, this is the plastics factory as well as the manufacturing factory one of three. We have three to have redundancy. Those were done in the plastic factory in under three months. And now we do 100% our own plastics and we give the country 100% uh, manure. You've seen probably some of you the flying cow image. What few people know, we even sponsored a lady who've been to the top of Mount Everest, having the Baladna flag, saying how high could our cows uh, reach up as people. 
And again, that fits our wellness concept where we'll be uh, putting s programs in schools, telling kids to move away from Coke and Pepsi, my previous jobs, and Vimto, uh, to moving to milk as a much healthy choice, especially dealing with uh, when people need at least uh, uh, liquid in their system. We first flew in the cows, then we brought them by ship. We have stopped bringing any cows now for the last six months because now we are self-sufficient even in the cows. Except in the area of organic milk, to speed up the organic milk, we need to fly in organic certified cows. Otherwise, it will take us two years. I know I'm running uh, short on time. I just want to give you here what we had as products. We were 100% self-sufficient in milk. Now we are 100% self-sufficient in dairy. So your cheeses on your pizza are coming from us as well as your desserts, your mhalabiyya, your rizf halib, the full range of dairy products we, we manufacture and we do, I believe, a good job. Every few days, somebody who realized I'm from Baladna asked me about Labni and why is the market uh, getting out of stock from Labni. So, to summarize, these are important elements for us in 2019. The IPO is happening, inshallah, as it was announced uh, last week by uh, the government authorities, to Bloomberg, we can say that, inshallah, before the end of this year will be public. Also, we have active CSR programs with all the NGOs uh, uh, with us, and we have an active programs with the schools. We have about two schools visiting us at the farm. We like to educate kids, the, especially the kids, that the milk actually does come from a cow, and the cow is in Qatar, versus it coming from the supermarket. It's very important role for us where we can discuss with the kids the educational aspect and the nutrition aspect and the partnership. These are very important uh, for us. I think uh, my time is, uh, is up. This is, this is taken from uh, the Atlas Mountain where we, we went up all the way. I, for me, what Qatar did and what Baladna did and the, definitely the vision and direction of His Highness was going above and seeing very far and deciding how, how to achieve things. I put my personal email address for people who have questions later in case we don't have the time for them. And I want to thank you for the opportunity to discuss uh, Baladna uh, and its experience with national food security programs. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Abdallah. Uh, we do have some time for some questions from members of our community or our guests. Uh, Dr. Abdallah will not be taking questions from the media today, and any members of the media are, who are present may direct uh, inquiries directly to Baladna. So, questions. Hi, um, good afternoon. Thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. My name is Firas Al Qassab. I work at Sidra Hospital right across the street. And uh, you, had, you had mentioned the uh, research and development partnership that you are building and you're seeking to, to in, I guess, increase with the educational institutions here in Qatar. Uh, can I ask you, just shed some light about the, the role that educational institutions can play in terms of creating educational programs and educating and upskilling graduates so that can participate and sort of this, you know, this new area that Qatar is blazing a trail in. Uh, so, so are there programs, educational programs, say at the two-year colleges and four-year colleges that your guys are looking at getting support to feed into your staff and your and, and your uh, employees in the future to help keep this sustainable from a human uh, or employee perspective? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Good question. Uh, again, the question, if I heard it, what, what are we doing with the, with, the, uh, with the educational institutions and the research institutions? And uh, do we have a feed of students going in through the system to work on that? Uh, let me give you an example of the research projects now submitted. One of them dealing with animal heat. Some of our cows produce more milk than others, up to 70 liters, let's say, per milk per, per day. So we are now testing which ones they do and how they're tolerant of the heat because Qatar has the highest humidity in the region. So we're checking which cows they are so that we will designate them as the ones to impregnate them and even use embryos from them to put them in the other cows so that we have a much better, healthier breed of cows as we move, move forward. And we are doing that with the joint research projects with, with Texas uh, A&M. The other one with, with Cornell, and probably they can speak about it, is genetics and trying to have, again, over time, a better breed that can tolerate the heat. All our newborn cows stay outside the first six months. 
All our imported cows came inside locked barns. By the way, we don't have air condition in the barns. We have wind tunnels and we have water. Now, we use a lot of water, by the way, about 700 liters per cow per day to keep the cow uh, cool. So there are programs that we are doing with them. In addition, we have an active internship program whereby we had interns from as far as England, France, uh, Lebanon, and at Qatar, where students are working jointly on, on these projects. I have to say this is very hard for the private sector to work with the universities. If I didn't do it, I've been doing this for about 15 years now, doing both. <laughs> it's very hard to talk to faculty who love to publish, but they don't maybe see the importance of the application of the research for us as a private sector. And it's very hard, very hard to talk to the general managers about the benefit of having someone who's doing a two-year research program. So we have to learn to talk the same language, and it's challenging. But uh, I'll be happy to take it offline if there is something specific. Now, on the area of nutrition, we need a lot of help. In the area of nutrition and food adjustments, uh, so that's another area that we will be looking at. Our juice, and I don't know if there's juice in front of you. We tried to send some juice, or it's in the back. We have a sample of our juices up there for everybody, single serve, to have. Our juice does not have added sugar, no added sugar. Now, there's sugar in juice, but no added sugar. Only if we move, and the region is already moving to sugar tax, only if you move to start saying this drink is really a flavor with sugar and water versus this is real juice. And you have the research to show people what's the benefit of one versus the other, especially in schools then can you support the food security programs and the country at large? I don't know if I answered your question. University or HBKU universities will have a college degree or a two-year degree no. for people to come in and, and be, be, I guess, employed by institutions like yourself. Uh, so upskilling the population in this industry that is right. part of the national food security. Regretfully, there is no college of agriculture in the country, regretfully. I think the way forward is to have diplomas or certificates. For the longest time, being in agriculture meant you're not going to make money. If you look at your image of a farmer, he or she are an older person who, who's happy being maybe next to a cow, but he or she is not rich. Uh, and all the young kids, especially probably here, wanted to design their own apps and become rich in less than two years. And so agriculture was not high on their agenda of a career. Nowadays, with national food security and where you integrate disruptive technology, throw in artificial intelligence, Maybe the kids will be interested in trying to combine those. But the way to go is to have a certificate programs, then diplomas, then you have the four-year programs, I believe. Do you know that there are only four, only four vets, Qatari vets in the whole country, as in nationals? Only four, imagine. Of course, we have a lot of vets who are expats. But we really need to, uh, for the universities to try and uh, start targeting this area. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, congratulations for your speech. Uh, my name is Libya, and coming from the commercial office of the Spanish Embassy. And at the commercial office, we have noticed that Balatna nowadays is the only brand that you can find in the supermarkets. So we are wondering, uh, now Balatna obviously is doing really well because it's not working the usual free, uh, let's say, free market. But how do you think Baladna at the end will face a real competition in Qatar with such a brand, premium brand like, for instance, President. Thank you. I mean, in a way, we are uh, victims of our own success because we are the first company that moved very fast to follow the new regulation and to have self-sufficiency. Uh, increasingly, you'll find different brands, and there are. But Baladna in key accounts has a block, a block format. So you find all our products next to each other. And so you tend to only, to only see that. But if you look, you'll find the almond milk, the soya milk, you'll find all the cheeses that probably you want. What you will not find anymore, alhamdulillah, are products made from powder. And if they are made from powder, they are saying reconstituted milk. Now, all the international players are adjusting. Before, let's call it as it is, Europe produces a lot of milk. With the extra milk, they make it into powder that they will send our way, but you are not allowed to send our products to Europe. Now, Qatar is saying, we are following the same rules, and so any international company now will have to follow the rules that they have in their own country on about being here. They are adjusting, so I think over time you'll find more active presence. 
Uh, also, I see, I have to say, there's another company here called Ghadir. Uh, so it's not only, only Baladna, but Baladna is very fast in introducing a lot of, uh, a lot of new products. Uh, uh, so to answer you, the customer and the consumer, they make the final decision on what they want to buy, and we need to satisfy uh, their, their interests. But there's no monopoly by the government to Baladna. We don't have support. As a matter of fact, Baladna and the farmers in Qatar get less support than the farmers in France or the farmers in Canada. So please, for people to keep in mind, thinking that Qatar is doing something exceptional by supporting us, it's only in line of what European countries do and what American countries do. Okay. I'd like to thank you all for coming out to the, um, uh, to the Dean's lecture today. Uh, I'd like to invite you to join us for a light lunch. Uh, so thank you all for coming out, and please uh, look forward to more Dean's Lecture in the term. Thanks again, Dr. Abdullah.